Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. More than 100 billion people have lived and died on Earth throughout its history, so it's no wonder we often look to the past to try and better understand the present. But with so many seemingly unexplained archaeological mysteries out there, and nuggets of apparently lost knowledge, it can be tricky to make sense of it all. Have you ever seen anything like that before? Pseudo-archaeology has ruled certain corners of popular science and history for decades now, and few theories are as intriguing as the idea that the great societies of the past may have been built by extraterrestrials. Everything from the pyramids to the Nazca lines to the Easter Island heads, much of the southern hemisphere in fact, all. and yet the fact remains that these astonishing structures do exist. They have been studied by scholars for thousands of years, and still no one's really sure how they came about. The far-fetched alien theory is actually quite a recent idea, and it's just one of many other proposals as to how ancient civilizations worked. But what are the real explanations for how they came to be? And is it time we changed how we see them? During the Renaissance, we had what were known as the Six Simple Machines, six classic inventions that were easy to make but vital for countless other important mechanisms, the basis for most, if not all, technological advancements ever since. They were the lever, the wheel and axle, the pulley, the inclined plane, the wedge, and the screw. But although this more official list only came about a few centuries ago, the ideas behind them actually date back to ancient Greece and further, with many of these inventions having been around for centuries and millennia beforehand. Even today, screws, wheels, and levers keep the world turning, sometimes literally, and it's impossible to overstate their importance. But to solve one of archaeology's biggest mysteries, how the pyramids were built, we only need to look at these six machines. The Pyramid of Khufu is the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still standing. 
The rest, like the Colossus of Rhodes, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, or the Lighthouse of Alexandria, have been destroyed for thousands of years. But despite the pyramids being more than 4,500 years old and, for a long time, being the tallest man-made structures in the world, until very recently we didn't know how the ancient Egyptians managed to build them. In 2018, archaeologists working in an ancient quarry close to the pyramid site came across a ramp carved into the ground. It was lined by holes that could have once been used for a complex rope and pulley system, already employing two of our simple machines, the inclined plane and the pulley. Though the particular ramp found in 2018 isn't thought to have directly supplied the pyramid builders, it does date back to around the same century that the pyramids were constructed, meaning the ancient Egyptians in general absolutely would have had access to technology like it. Interestingly, another probable misconception about the pyramids is that they were built by slaves. Increasingly, it's believed that the laborers who worked for decades to build the Pyramid of Khufu were almost definitely not slaves. One invention that we're fairly sure the Egyptians didn't have, however, something that would have made building the pyramids much easier, was the construction crane. The first building cranes were used by the Greeks in the 6th century BC, at least 1400 years after the pyramids were completed. But an earlier type of crane had been used for irrigation before then, to lift and move water in ancient Mesopotamian societies as far back as around 3000 BC. Across the long span of human history, agriculture has actually informed technological advancement like this far more significantly than the building of grand monuments ever has, with the invention of farming from at least 10,000 BC paving the way for most key developments. The distinct terraces used for growing crops in the Andes have been there for thousands of years, for example, and South American civilizations like the Mayans and the Incas employed aqueducts and used pressurized water, too. The aqueducts can still be seen in famous ruins like those at Machu Picchu, at a place that's sometimes called the Stairway of Fountains. Of course, the Romans also built advanced aqueducts all across their empire, and it is true that a lot of civilization as we know it was perfected in ancient Rome, but not necessarily born there. It's thought that the earliest sewage and sanitation system, for example, was actually developed by the Indus Valley Civilization, a Bronze Age society across what's now Pakistan, as well as parts of Afghanistan and India. They had private toilets connected to sewers at least 4,000 years ago. For comparison, the city of London didn't have true sewers until 1866, and they were only widely installed after thousands of people had died of cholera from drinking the dirty water of the River Thames which was itself, in those days, an open sewer. So it's clear that key cornerstone inventions date a long, long way back, and much of today's technology effectively amounts to an update on ancient times. But what's most mind-boggling is that archaeologists have also found ancient tech that defies scientific explanation today, like Damascus steel. While Damascus was once an integral city in the trade and manufacture of weapons, this unique metal was instantly recognizable the world over for its characteristic wavy appearance. But more than simply looking good, these blades were also much stronger and more flexible than those made from any other metal. The production of Damascus steel stopped in the 18th century, though, and since then, well, we've been at a loss to work out precisely how it was originally forged. Remarkably, upon closer inspection in recent years, it's been found that Damascus steel blades contain carbon nanotubes, so this particular aspect of nanotechnology, that apparently newfangled frontier for modern tech companies, was actually being used in the Middle East as long ago as the 3rd century AD. And not only for Damascus steel, either. Ancient nanotech has also been found in the Lycurgus Cup, a Roman chalice capable of changing color with the light. As with Damascus steel, contemporary scientists just aren't sure what the original technique used to make the cup was. How did state-of-the-art tech, today's state-of-the-art tech, come to be in a sword or goblet from thousands of years ago? That's all well and good, you might say, but what about computers? If there's one technological advancement to define our generation, then it's that, right? Well, technically, from some perspectives, no. The first mechanical computer is actually older than both Damascus steel and the Lycurgus cup. The Antikythera mechanism was an ancient Greek device thought to have been used to calculate the position of the moon and stars, and it belongs to the first century BC. Sure, it's been a long journey between then and the machines of today, but the first stones in the groundwork for modern computing were laid in ancient times. Hot on the tails of the first computer was the first programmable robot, built by the Greek mathematician Heron of Alexandria in, and yes, you're hearing right, the first century AD. This robot was a stringed mechanism that moved using ropes wound around strings. 
perhaps more puppet-like to modern mind. Why then, whenever a building or a story from the past feels in any way incomprehensible to us, should we so quickly rush to various pseudo-archaeological explanations? Rather than ancient aliens, perhaps it'd make more sense that civilizations long gone might have simply been skilled and equipped enough to achieve something as grand as the pyramids, or Stonehenge, or the Easter Island statues. Ancient technology from across the globe is and was significantly more advanced than it usually gets credit for. Los Incas tenían un alto conocimiento en astronomía, medicina, matemática, entre otras cosas. Pero los invasores españoles tenían la pólvora. With inventions typically associated with the Renaissance period or even the Industrial Revolution often predating those times by thousands of years. And that's how ancient civilizations had modern technology.
let's stir the mind with a few contemplations. We are told that the first true power tool was invented in 1895, when a German company combined an electric motor with a manual drill. The drill weighed 16 and a half pounds and required multiple operators. It wasn't until 1957 that a company called Bosch began designing power tools in bulk that were both economical and powerful. So then how did our historical ancestors, a more primitive, underdeveloped people, design and build some of the structures we encounter? What about all the gigantic monolithic stones we encounter that have been cut with such precision? Ask yourself, could you repeat this today with the arsenal of equipment we have at our disposal? And what about the magnificent ancient step wells of the East? Step wells, we are told, were multi-storied wells built by our primitive ancestors as ways to preserve the water supply during droughts. But look at the intricacy and complexity of these structures. Look at the glory and the finesse. Look at the geometric precision. All dug out and crafted from using hand tools. Yeah, right. What about the gigantic canal networks we find all over the world? The Erie Canal in America was allegedly built between 1817 and 1825. There were no civil engineers in America at this time. The people responsible for planning construction were novices, we are told. The canal is 12 meters wide and 4 meters deep. The Erie Canal spans 363 miles. But this was not just a case of digging each day for the Irish immigrants and their oxen companions. They had to fell hundreds of trees as they passed through the virgin forest. They had to build complicated aqueducts and locks and they had to pass through the Niagara Escarpment, an 80 foot high wall of hard limestone. They had to use black powder to blast through this, we are told, as dynamite had yet to be invented. The canal spans 363 miles and was constructed over an eight year period. This means that on average, one mile was completed every eight days. What a record, especially since those responsible were novices and power tools and dynamite were yet to be invented. I can tell you now, the so-called early settlers of the Americas did not build these canal systems. And what of the grand and magnificent castles scattered across our realm? Did you know that most were designed and constructed without plumbing systems and methods to heat rooms properly? Hmm. The royal and the elite of the past were content without having the accessible necessities of survival just as long as they could live within the grand and the glorious. While the peasants, in their modest abodes, enjoyed warmth throughout the long dark winters? I don't think so. And of course, there is the impossibility of the Great Giza Pyramid Complex. The pyramids, we are told, were constructed somewhere around 2500 BC. The Great Pyramid itself consists of 2.3 million blocks of limestone and granite, and its overall structure weighs 6 million tons. The largest granite stones weigh between 20 and 80 tons each. 20 tons is 20,000 kilograms. These blocks were carved from quarries with copper chisels and allegedly transported from 800 kilometers away. 
The so-called experts can only theorize that a vast amount of slave labor was required. Being gullible and falling for the official narrative of slave labor is one thing. But can someone please explain how the air shafts of the Great Pyramid align so neatly with the circumpolar stars? And then there is the curious case of star forts, or what the official liars of the world call bastion forts. Developed in the late 15th and early 16th century, these forts, we are told, were designed during an era of gunpowder and the cannon. The geometric design offered a nation's military protection against blind spots during conflict. Of course they did. We all know that the best protection during war is to design a fort with such precise geometric patterning. Has any real historian ever stopped to think just how perfect the geometry is here? Our primitive ancestors did not have the technology to view structures from above, but they still managed to achieve this? Give me strength, there is no way. We could not produce such perfect geometry on this scale today. We've been fooled once again. We have been indoctrinated with a false historical narrative and timeline. And, like the silly heliocentric model, all it takes is a closer look at this narrative and things soon start to fall apart and the lies become so blatantly evident. Because of their satanic lies, piecing together an accurate, honest historical timeline has become an impossible Rubik's Cube. The official narrative, a Pandora's box, only offering us tiny clues, half-truths, and deceptions. The stitchings of our true historical timeline have been loosened. The contents are raised and muddled before we were even born into this world. And herein lies the problem. How to know where you are going if you don't know where you are in the first place. But you see, awakening is truly a gift. Once awake, we learn that we've always had the answers right in front of us. We've always had more than we know. But we had to regain our sight first before things started falling into place. Before things started to make a little more sense. And here we are again, viewer, at the precipice of another great journey. What if I told you that before us there existed a civilization that was responsible for the most advanced technology ever developed, and that it was their understanding of the workings of our flat realm that was key to their innovation? And what if I told you that it is highly likely that our true history as a people only begun just over 200 years ago. Would you think of me as mad once again? Do I sound as preposterous as when I first told you that the earth is flat? Perhaps, and that's why I need to show you. What I hope to show you is one of the greatest cover-ups of all time. It is on par with the heliocentric lie in its enormity and the impact it has upon humanity. And, as I will try to show you, it is inextricable from the true nature of our flat realm Earth, and you cannot understand one without understanding the other. We cannot waste time, for we must journey in search of lost time. At its heart, this is a story about deception. It is also a story of endings and beginnings, of death and rebirth. And please bear with me. 
Due to the deceptions and falsities underpinning our historical narrative, this story cannot be told in a linear fashion. We need to go back and forth in time to really draw out something that brings us a little closer to the truth. It is also imperative to understand that like much contemporary science, history as a discipline was corrupted a long time ago. At its most innocent, a lot of established historical narrative is guesswork. But at its worst, it is a set of lies agreed upon, as the so-called Napoleon put it so succinctly. We are going to be digging in the dark. No historian will be there to help us. We are alone in this journey. Our journey is a hunt for things buried in plain sight. And things may become a little uncomfortable at times, but it is necessary. We have been living a comfortable lie for far too long now. Come on, jump in and put your seatbelt on. For to understand our place in the world, we need to do the unthinkable. It's time for us to take a journey back to the future. Our journey begins in the unlikeliest of places. 19th century St. Petersburg, at the entrance to St. Isaac's Cathedral. The city cold, the early morning mists dissipating with the approach of the sun, and our boots caked in mud. The year is 1860, and while St. Petersburg stands regal and proud, its inhabitants are nowhere to be found. It is quiet, too quiet. The population of St. Petersburg in the 1860s was, we are told, roughly 500,000 people, and yet there is not a soul in sight. Where is everybody? The long shadow of Alexander Column gives us a clue as to the time of the sun's journey above this region. Long shadows only occur during morning or evening. It must be morning, but it appears that no one has surfaced yet. If we travel 400 miles across to Moscow, we see the same thing. Empty quiet streets. In 1860, Moscow shared a similar population with St. Petersburg, roughly 500,000 citizens. But again, where is everybody? What about the rest of the world during this time period? Edinburgh, Scotland, 1840s. Copenhagen, Denmark, 1840s. Dresden, Germany, 1860s. Rio in Brazil, 1860s. Toronto, Canada, 1860s. Athens in Greece, 1860s. And then London, finally, people. A 
And what about Paris? People, life. The first photograph, we are told, was created in 1822. The art of photography relies on methods of juxtaposition, of comparison and contrast to deliver its message and sentiment. In these old photographs, we do not find the same deliberate techniques of juxtaposition that contemporary photographers craft into their art but rather we find natural contrasts that are so important and central to navigating through our deceptive history. Contrast is a phenomenon, natural or artificial, in which meaning is generated and conveyed through the comparison of two opposing elements. When looking at 1860s Russia, there is an immediate contrast between the lack of population and the sheer size of these cities. Even in the 19th century, both Moscow and St. Petersburg are enormous. The infrastructure found in the photographs could hold a population well into the millions. Why are the cities so vast if the population was only 500,000? Furthermore, the official narrative gives us a population that increases in a linear fashion from 1764. Many of the buildings we see here were built years before the photograph was taken. Did the Russians just plan well in advance? But it's when the population is introduced into these photographs that a new contrast emerges that is staggering. That is, between the people and the environment itself. It may be the reduced population numbers, or it may be the monochromatic starkness of the black and white images, but they present to us something that we've lived amongst our entire lives and never paid any mind to. That is, the enormity an impossibility of the architecture. As we engage with the industry and act of tourism, we journey from place to place and observe, taking it all in, learning, hearing and being told what we are looking at and how it came to be. And standing in front of a structure like the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, we might even exclaim, wow, how did they do this? But the moment, inextricably wrapped up in the busyness of the scene, perhaps prevents us from really asking that question with sincerity. Standing in front of a structure like the Arc de Triomphe, while the crowd frantically takes pictures on their smartphones, makes it all a reality. And we conclude, before being shoved away by new tourists, well, they had to have done it somehow because I'm here and looking at it. During our indoctrination at school, we are seldom shown old photographs of the grand cities scattered around our flat realm. And perhaps for good reason, because when we marinate on images like this and are presented with the visual evidence of a very primitive Victorian people dotted around like grasshoppers within the shadows of the most magnificent, grandiose, brilliant architecture a human could ever imagine, we begin to have doubts. Indeed, how did they build this? The Arc de Triomphe is made from 36,695 cube meters of limestone and weighs 95,407 tons or just over 95 million 
kilograms. They tell us it took 12 years to build the giant arch in two different periods, between 1806 to 1814 and between 1832 to 1836. How did they transport this amount of limestone with the same horse and carts that we see in the photographs? Look closer at the four sculptures that adorn each of its sides. Look at the intricacy of the sculptures and the patterning of the ornamentation that frames the arch. Each section is perfectly repeated without any deviation or inconsistency. The first true power tool was not invented until 60 years after this arch was completed. They tell us this was crafted by hand. Is that even possible? And then there is the ceiling of the arch. Immaculate, 3D sculpted roses. Perfect in their geometric symmetry. The nuance of the detail and finesse of each petal and cross-section borders is overwhelming. Look at the rest of Paris during this time. Again, a plethora of unbelievable, gigantic and magnificent structures. The city's infrastructure glorious and the people and their means of transport primitive unsophisticated and seeming not at all developed to the point of producing a city like this. The roads are improperly paved and uneven. They are dirty and muddy. We also see buildings during this period in which the architecture aligns with the inhabitants. Buildings of misshapen proportions, less developed and refined, Charming in their own way, but coarse in their use of wood and plaster. This is exactly the type of architecture we expect of a generation of horse and cart. A generation ignorant to the discoveries in technology that would follow in the years to come. Furthermore, at the time of this photograph, the arch is roughly 40 years old since its completion. Yet can you see how worn some of the parts of the structure are? We see weathering on the stone that suggests the arch is much older. As we approach the late 19th century, we see that the people of Moscow have finally decided to leave their homes and venture out into the streets. The infamous Red Square, now bustling with life. St. Basil's Cathedral, and the Spaskaya Tower dominate the frame of the square. The construction of St. Basil's Cathedral began in 1555 and was completed in 1561, a mere six years. It suffered a huge fire in 1737 and underwent restoration over a 20 year period. But look at it, what a structure, almost unreal and like no other. It is composed of thousands of red bricks and tin sheet metal that has been shaped into the distinctive onion domes we see. Look closer at the intricacy of the domes. How did they bend metal to achieve such precision and perfection in the 18th century? And again, if they had the skills and dedication to build a wonder such as this, then why are the conditions of the road so poor and covered in mud? We see these incredible structures and buildings everywhere in 19th century photography. We have the wondrous Crystal Palace of London, a monstrous structure with the greatest area of glass ever seen in a building 
and all constructed before England had automatic glass manufacturing. We have Westminster Abbey and Parliament. We have the old Euston Arch, constructed out of pure sandstone in 1837, and streets unpaved and full of mud. Why did these people not prioritize the streets they walked upon? The Frauenkirk, the domed masterpiece of Dresden, Germany. Its intricate and opulent splendor in direct contrast with the beat-up wagons and horse-pulled carts of the people below, a people dependent on the bare necessities, a people completely dwarfed by its size and majesty. The Library of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada, built over a period of 17 years. The first major settlers arrived in 1800 and at the time of construction, the city's population was under 20,000. Would a grand, glorious library really be a priority for settlers? Why does the building look like it's been cropped out of Europe and pasted into Canada? Even at the turn of the century, 40 years before Bosch economized the power tool, we have the old Penn Station in New York. Look at the size of this. Completely mind-blowing proportions. As we can see here in the photograph, each octagonal sculpted pattern on the arched dome ceiling is larger than one individual human. Look at the gigantic columns and detailed asanthus leaves decorating the tops of each pillar. They tell us this station took six years to build. Six whole years. Yeah right. Why are we so gullible? Even without access to modern power tools, printable construction pieces and crane technology, we could not reproduce this today. And more importantly, we don't reproduce this type of architecture today. The official liars of our world have an umbrella term for this type of architecture that we see in North America. They call it historism. Historism is a term coined to describe a style of architecture that is revival in nature, or in other words, copies the style of another period in time. The grand arches and buildings with giant columns we see are built in the classical or Greco-Roman style and the cathedrals are built in the Renaissance and Gothic styles of medieval Europe. Components of these particular styles of architecture feature large spires, arched windows, towers, turrets, domes, arcaded arches, sculptures, enormous doors, circular geometric windows, columns, clock faces and bell towers. Traces of this impossible architecture are literally found everywhere, in every city and across our world today. Some preserved and maintained, like the Parisian Arc de Triomphe and Notre Dame, and others lost and long forgotten to time like the Euston Arch and the old Penn Station in New York. We as a people travel miles to take our own photographs of these wonders. But the photographers of the 19th century gift us with something. Something they would never have expected to give a future generation. Perspective. 
we see a primitive people against a backdrop of clearly advanced architectural infrastructure. The official historians of the world tell us tales of Darwinian evolution and progression between time periods. The people that came after were always more advanced in their ways, refining and redefining the methods of the generation that came before. If the height of innovation and industry during the 19th century was still the horse and cart as a means of travel, then, as these photographs tell us, this style of architecture was just as impossible for those living in the centuries before it. Anyone with a predisposition for thinking and questioning can immediately sense when looking at these photographs that something is rotten in Denmark, that something is off with the mainstream historical narrative, that something is not adding up. In a panoramic image of San Francisco in 1877, we see a collage of historicist architecture. We see columns adorning the entrances to very regal buildings that stand out like sore thumbs from some of the timber shacks surrounding it. We see gothic spires and towers in the distance. We see domed cathedrals and buildings. We also see just how sprawling and huge the city has become. In 1846, there were under 500 Mormon settlers living on the area of land in which we now call San Francisco. It was frontier land and ready for the taking. Between 1848 and 1849, with the start of the California Gold Rush, the population increased from 1,000 people to 25,000 people. 28 years later, this panorama was taken. The population at this time, we are told, was getting close to 200,000. Who in their right mind would believe this story? Does this look like a city of 200,000 people? Without any modern technology, power tools, automatic manufacturing, electric motors. A people in a strange, unfounded land just making their mark. Do we really believe that a burgeoning people built this entire city in just 30 years? And again, such quietness, such stillness. This is a photograph of an empty city. Where are all the people? The shadow of the post here tells us that it is not the early hours of the morning. Short shadows only appear toward midday. A city of this scale at noon should be bustling with life. But there is not a single person in the shot of this panorama. The only life we see is that of a horse without any master in sight. It seems highly unlikely that all the people were told to stay indoors because a cityscape photo shoot was taking place. And this silent scene becomes all the more eerie when we consider that there is intention behind the lens. Someone was there, standing at a vantage point and taking this photograph. But who? And for what? And what are the chances that in the 19th century, during similar decades, we see deserted Russian, European, and North American cities photographed like this. And then only a few years later, we find the same locations bustling with people. 
a people clearly incapable of building the architecture found in these cities. And what to do with these photographs? If we accept the narrative and these strange anomalies, then we stop here and get back to our busy lives. But the narrative we've received is not the truth. And we shouldn't accept any narrative, no matter how official and certified it is, unless it makes sense. The people we see in these photographs and their early ancestors could not have built the magnificent architecture we see. It is an impossibility. Come on, jump in. We must venture further into these cities and look a little closer. There must be some clues waiting to be uncovered that helps us understand why these cities are empty. Wait, what's that you say? You want to wipe the mud from your boots first? Do not bother, it's a waste of time. Come on, jump in and let's go. For it is the mud that offers us some small clues as to what could have occurred during this time period. In June 2011, Christchurch, New Zealand suffered an earthquake that left a lot of the city in chaos, destroying buildings and infrastructure and leaving over 50,000 homes without power. As a result, there were collapsed houses, ruptured water mains, flooding and fires due to disrupted electrical lines. Due to the strong ground motions and intense shaking, part of the city experienced a strange phenomenon known as soil liquefaction. Sand boils emerged from asphalt roads, toppling and sinking cars, and causing boulders to fall from hills, resulting in more home damage. Soil liquefaction occurs when saturated soil loses its strength and stiffness in response to an applied stress, such as shaking or other sudden changes, such as a strong explosion. Loose, saturated soil or sand has a tendency to compress when a load is applied, but in the event of a stress, such as shaking or an explosion, we see the opposite. The soil tends to dilute and the result is treacherous quicksand or quick clay. The land turns to liquid causing structures of heavy mass such as buildings, infrastructure and cars to start sinking, topple over or collapse. It can also affect dams and bridges. Turbidity currents can also form huge landslides that are impossible to stop. In the worst case scenario, entire cities may be destroyed. As you can see, liquefaction can move entire areas of land. The mud can rise dramatically and rapidly and its destructive force is unstoppable. It is a well-documented phenomenon. The 1964 earthquake in Nagata, Japan caused liquefaction and we can see the effects very clearly in these photos. The same here with the 1964 Alaska earthquake. Buildings toppling, cars sinking, infrastructure collapsing. Once the stress has subsided, the soil begins to solidify once again and we can see the aftermath. Uneven muddy streets remain where there was once road paving. Returning to photographs of 19th century cities, we see a similar situation here. The roads are unrefined and full of mud. We see unsophisticated, uneven, coarse and muddy roads everywhere against a backdrop of refined, sophisticated and magnificent architecture. 
Could these cities have suffered the similar fate of soil liquefaction that we see in more recent times? Perhaps. But unfortunately, muddy roads is not enough evidence to base any conclusions on, is it? Children are some most vital of questions. And adults, in their foggy stupor, usually provide the most unsatisfactory answers. Often regurgitating learned nonsensical information that leave the child's imagination unfulfilled. Squelching along these muddy 19th century roads, observing their surroundings, a child may ask, why did they build the windows so low to the ground? And what an excellent question. Yes, why indeed did they build windows on ground level? For you see, the people we see in these photographs, sadly, did not build this architecture. And maybe some of them, at some point in their busy day-to-day -day life, ask the exact same question. We see it everywhere. Windows at ground level. Windows partially below ground level. First floor entrances raised from the ground level. Steps leading down to entrances below ground level. We can find this in almost every major city across our realm. In both old photographs and when we walk in the streets today. And what does it tell us? That a society with access to modest construction tools and horse and car constructed their infrastructure by first spending countless amounts of hours and energy, clearing land with a depth of over three meters to begin their construction? Building basement floors is incredibly hard work. Since the 20th century, large powered excavation machines, such as backhoes and front end loaders, have reduced the time and manpower needed to dig a basement dramatically as compared to digging by hand with a spade. Perhaps you could say that our historical ancestors were just that dedicated to the architecture they built. And you could say that many of the sunken buildings we see are actually due to elevations and depressions in the natural landscape. The official narrative, which is always full of inconsistencies, perhaps would suffice if it was not for contemporary excavation. When we look at photographs such as this, it immediately dawns upon us that what we are seeing are windows and doors two to three meters below the ground surface. Why are there windows and doors underground? What is this that we see in our cities? Natural soil accumulation over time? 
Geologists have never been able to ascribe a consistent value to worldwide natural topsoil accumulation because it is impossible. Some regions of our realm experience consistent topsoil accumulation, whereas other regions actually experience consistent erosion. Many historians and archaeologists have noted that many cities over the centuries have been destroyed through war, a natural phenomenon such as earthquakes, volcanic ash and flooding. Aren't these just the layers of previous civilizations? No, they are not. We see over and over again whole floors of buildings consistent with the architecture existing above the layer of ground. You see, what lies beneath is not the unfamiliar traces of previous generations, but of the same generation that built these structures. And once you really see this kind of sunken, buried infrastructure that exists in such prevalence across our world, you can never unsee it. we see that the foundations of old churches are actually the original first floors with consistent entrances and windows. We see mosaics unearthed. We see pillars, columns and arches that were originally much larger. And it was the layer of soil that reduced their size. As if they weren't big enough to begin with. And like with the 1964 earthquake in Nagata, Japan, we also find many so-called ancient structures that are leaning. As if at some point, the soil beneath these structures loosened and liquefied. We have the Saharzan Church Tower and our dear lady at the Mountain Church Tower in Germany the Tiger Hill Pagoda in China, the Leaning Tower of Neveyansk in Russia, the Leaning Temple of Huma in India, Udkirk in the Netherlands, the Tower of Zaragoza in Spain and, of course, the Tower of Pisa. The official liars of the world try to justify the buried and tilting structures we see, filling our heads with stories of antiquity and ever-changing geology but it becomes trickier for them 
when we turn our attention to America. If we are to believe their narrative, then all of the buildings we see in 19th century photographs of the burgeoning American cities are newly constructed. Why do we see famous structures, such as the Washington Capitol building, with consistent infrastructure that buries very deep into the ground? And again, the inconsistencies do not add up. Why would an underdeveloped people waste resources, energy and time constructing the foundations of the Capitol building to be consistent with the column style we find above the surface? The foundations did not have to feature columns. Columns, we are told, are a stylistic choice not a functional one. So why would they do this? In a nutshell, they wouldn't. We see images that suggest that the people of the 19th century were actually concerned with moving a lot of the vast amount of mud we see, leveling the ground and excavating existing structures. The consistency and prevalence of buried architecture across our realm indicate that whatever happened was a worldwide event, despite regional differences in natural topsoil accumulation and erosion. And there is no official narrative explanation that justifies the buried architecture we see. No explanation provided to justify the amount of mud we see in 19th century photographs of our cities. On the roads, mud piles from clearing, the roads uneven, the land ravaged, but the architecture grand, perfect and intact. Applauded by literary scholars for his use of fog, as an opening simile and metaphor to paint a portrait of London as a corrupted hub amidst burgeoning industrialization. Many often overlook that Charles Dickens's 1852 novel Bleak House actually opens with a different image. London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather. As much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. Liquefaction caused havoc across Christchurch and the Garter. But these were isolated earthquake events and only portions of each city were affected. It is not possible for there to have been huge, simultaneous earthquakes around the world during a similar period. Or is it? Even Wikipedia tells us that liquefaction can occur naturally or artificially, from an earthquake or other sudden change in stress condition. Even if this was the case, we do not see the same structural damage to the buildings in the 19th century like we do in cases such as Christchurch and Nagata. Most of the buried architecture we see is intact. It is either sunken or the ground level has been raised at least 3 meters, sometimes in a uniform manner 
and other times partially buried in rolling mud hills, as if there were huge landslides. The strange case of the buried architecture provides the following conclusions. That what lies beneath are not the remains of previous civilizations. More often than not, the buried structures are consistent with the architecture we see above ground. That the structures are much larger than originally suspected. And therefore they are even more of a construction impossibility for a Victorian generation of horse and car and those existing before them. That natural topsoil accumulation and soil liquefaction are not satisfactory explanations for what we see here. Whatever took place had to be something much larger and widespread, such as a natural or artificial earthly cataclysm of sorts. As many of the photographs show, Many citizens of the 1800s were responsible for moving much of the mud, leveling the ground and excavating buildings, which suggests that whatever happened had happened very recently in their past. The complete absence of a reasonable mainstream justification for the buried architecture we see suggests that the controllers of our realm are deliberately trying to hide whatever happened. And what of the deserted cities we see in the earlier photographs? If these cities were truly empty, then we must ask why. We must also ask how all the people got there in the end. In the space of 30 or so years, we see a city go from barren to bustling. Interestingly, it is Charles Dickens and 19th century literature more generally that offers some clues. Two central themes run throughout 19th century Victorian literature. That of marriage and female chastity and that of orphans and adoption. Many of the fictional characters we've come to love over the years are orphans. We have Oliver Twist and Pip from Great Expectations. We have little orphan Jane Eyre and Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights. We have Mowgli from The Jungle Book, Cosette from Les Miserables. We have Heidi, Rapunzel, Peter Pan, Snow White. We have Tom Sawyer, and Huckleberry Finn, and Anne of Green Gables. And these books were of their time, as far as orphan prevalence goes. The only issue is that these novels romanticize the orphan as a figure, dislocated from society by default, and therefore pave their life's path as one of unforeseen opportunity. This was not reality. The theme of marriage and chastity that we find in so many 19th century literary works, such as those by Jane Austen, the Brontes, George Eliot, Dickens, Thomas Hardy, Leo Tolstoy, Victor Hugo and more, was nothing more than carefully disguised, well-written propaganda with the sole purpose to solidify and justify a social value framework that would separate children from their mothers. Children born outside of marriage or wedlock were regarded as illegitimate, meaning they did not have a legal status. Illegitimate children was a serious stigma throughout the 19th century. The majority of employers would not hire women with an illegitimate child. Many unwed mothers with illegitimate children ended up without a home, in poor health, starving, exhausted, 
Their only place of refuge would be the workhouse, where they would carry out the most unpleasant duties. In some places, women with illegitimate children were singled out and had to wear a special uniform, which alerted everyone to their status as an unmarried mother or fallen woman. As a result, a vast amount of orphanages and foundling institutions were established. This is the London Foundling Hospital that was very active in the 19th century. Look at the size of it. Charles Dickens was obsessed with this place. Inspiration, they say. The official narrative tells us that an estimated 4,500 women handed over their children to this huge building. But this was just one institution. Wikipedia gives us a partial list of over 64 orphanages that were founded in the UK during the 19th century. The list is only partial. The peculiar case of the vast amount of parentless children in the 19th century is well documented by many researchers. And most of them agree, it is almost impossible to establish figures that really do justice to just how many orphans there were during this period. Their footprint did not enter the record book. It formed in the mud and was then washed away. It wasn't just the UK. This was a worldwide phenomenon. New York City had four foundling asylums alone that processed thousands of children annually. By the beginning of the 20th century, Italy was reporting 32,000 children per year. Spain and Portugal were reporting 15,000 annual foundlings. Before 1860, 374,000 recorded infants were processed by the asylums in Milan, Naples and Florence alone. Historian David L. Ransell states that Moscow was receiving between 16 and 18,000 infants annually by the 1880s and sending over 10,000 of these each year to outlying villages for care. In 1882, there were all told 41,720 foundlings from the Moscow home living with 32,000 foster families scattered throughout 4,418 villages. A dozen villages had over 90 fosterings each. One thing that is often overlooked is that there were a series of laws passed in the 1800s, making it almost impossible for unwed mothers to keep their babies. The 1833 Poor Law Reformation introduced bastardy clauses that shifted the entire responsibility for the illegitimate child onto the mother. Social stigma meant that she would not be able to provide care for her child and would be forced to hand them over to the authorities, or worse. Advertisements for adoption or nurse care became popular in newspapers. And, as many scholars have pointed out, these were a front for what was termed baby farmers, or paid murder. As Dorothy L. Hallas states, The adverts may have been misleading to the general public, but read like a coded message to unwed mothers. No references are asked for, and none are offered. The sum of 15 shillings a week to keep an infant or a sickly child was inadequate, and a sickly child and an infant under two months were the least likely to survive and the cheapest to bury. 
Infants were taken, no questions asked. And it was understood that for £12, no questions were expected to be asked. The transaction between the mother and the baby farmer usually took place in a public place, on public transportation, or through a second party. No personal information was exchanged, the money was paid, and the transaction was complete. The mother knew she would never see her infant alive again. Most children, however, were not murdered, but were dropped off at the doorsteps of orphanages or the workhouse. All children taken into these institutions were given entirely new identities. They were provided for with shelter, food and clothing temporarily and then sent off to workhouses or another location. Photographs in the 19th century were scarce, but towards the end of the century, we see more photographs and the last continent to experience such mass exodus of orphans was the United States. And it is here that we see evidence of the orphan trains. The first group of these orphans arrived in Michigan in 1854. And from that moment on, the movement shipped hundreds of thousands of children across the states until it ended in 1929. Officially, there were over 97 institutions involved in orphans and orphan trains in the 19th century. And again, this was not just the United States. Annie McPherson will go down in history as a woman who scammed more than a hundred thousand foundlings and shipped them from the United Kingdom to Canada, New Zealand and South Africa and even to the outer edges of the earth in Australia so that they could be sold into child labour. Why do we see so many photographs of orphans in workhouses? Why are they working with machinery created for adult use? Were there not enough adults during this time to carry out this work? And then there is the strange case of the burgeoning American amusement parks at the turn of the 20th century. In addition to rides and exhibits, many of these parks featured an unusual attraction. Infantoriums. Visitors of these parts could stroll around with ice cream and swing by these stations. A visit equivalent to that of a fully functional neonatal intensive care unit, complete with incubators filled with sleeping, premature babies. History has been kind to Martin Cooney. Touted as a hero, Cooney was the German mind behind the incubators. His first encounter with premature babies, we are told, was at the 1896 World's Fair. He knew immediately that the exhibition would save babies' lives. The technology to keep premature babies alive was expensive and he knew the public would pay to see the babies in incubators. He would charge an entrance fee at the amusement parks to generate funds to help these babies live. Nurses tended to the babies as an enraptured public looked on. Like any other amusement, the premature baby exhibits included carnival barkers who tried to lure the public to come and see the babies. I don't know about you, but I find something very off about these incubators. Advertisers featuring living babies. A lot of the fairs where Cooney showed his babies also featured eugenics exhibitions. Eugenics is a field of corrupted pseudoscience that endorses selective breeding to improve the genetic quality of the human population. 
Eugenics was inspired by Darwinism and was a driving ideology that fueled the Nazis. Why are people paying to see living babies as if they had never seen a living infant before? Did people of the time not have their own babies? And where are these infants' parents? How did they have the technology in the 19th century to keep premature babies alive in such a way? Or is something off, once again, with the official narrative? There were 80,000 premature babies who were treated in these amusement park incubators. 80,000. The hundreds of thousands of orphans in the 19th century are just barely believable. Were women really that carefree? Did America even have the population numbers to justify 80,000 premature babies? We are not talking orphans here, but infants born prematurely. The narrative is not convincing or realistically fathomable. Where did these babies come from? More troubling is Cooney's background. As many historians have pointed out, he had no medical degree or training. His story is a very similar one of unconvincing philanthropy that we find surrounding some of our contemporary figures today that also do not have medical degrees. And then there is Marie Dressler, a Canadian silent film and Depression-era movie star. She adopted one of these incubator babies. Ah, celebrities and adoption. The official narrative conveniently leaves this out of her story and tells us that she may have had a daughter who died as a small child. But the photographs suggest otherwise. Did she adopt her incubator baby at one of these fairs? Were the fairs a front for illicit adoption of premature babies? Even if they were premature, did that mean they had no parents? Who owned and was responsible for these parks? And what happened to the babies once they grew and left the incubators? If something feels eerily wrong about the entire narrative surrounding these parks and orphans, it's because we are not being told the truth. Why were there hundreds of thousands of parentless children in the 19th century? Where did they come from? They were relocated all over the world. Europe, America, Russia, Australia, Canada. Why? Especially when most still had a living parent. If pregnancy out of wedlock was such a social stigma that resulted in such trauma, why would so many people put themselves in that position in the first place? Did the government really care about social morality enough to pass laws. And all the effort to build and maintain orphanages and orphan relocation networks. Would this not burden governmental finances and administration systems? It certainly would have. But you see, there was a greater purpose behind the government's worldwide agenda. Repopulation. The social narrative of chastity was nothing more than propaganda and justification for stealing children. The reason we see empty cities in the early 19th century is because they were in fact empty, void of population. And the reason they are bustling 30 years later is because orphans were shipped into these cities to repopulate them. You see, in the early 19th century, 
there was a worldwide reset of sorts through depopulation and then repopulation. The people we see in these photographs did not build this architecture. They inherited it, along with a lot of mud. Not only did they inherit it without a clue as to what it actually was and who it belonged to, but they were unknowingly complicit in repurposing pretty much all of these structures. I know, none of this is making much sense at the minute. You are probably wondering why on earth these cities were empty and full of mud. What happened that meant governments needed to repopulate the earth? And I know what you're thinking. This is all very intriguing, but what does this have to do with flat earth? You want to know more about the firmament, the sun and moon, and our stationary plane. Do not worry. Everything will become clearer as we continue our journey. The prevalent evidence of buried infrastructure, coupled with deserted cities and a burgeoning industry of orphans, is just a start. These are all necessary clues, hinting at some kind of cataclysm, but the real story hasn't truly begun yet. The stage had to be set first, and now it is ready. And even if you cannot see it yet, I know you feel it, viewer. The deserted cities, the buried architecture, and orphans all signal a looming darkness. There is a great black cloud in front of us, and I won't lie, we are heading right into the heart of it. And like I said before, we do not have much time. Come on, it's time for me to honor my promise and take you back to the future. Water, an inorganic, transparent and odorless chemical substance that covers 70% of the known Earth's surface. It is the driving life force behind the carbon-based organisms that flourish on our Earth. It borders and separates our lands and collects and solidifies at the inner and outer regions of our flat, stationary realm. God should have sent a message to the inhabitants of Earth and been precise and told them to watch the water, to meditate on its function and natural laws, because in their time a great deception would be cast over them, like a cold shadow of an unknown nefarious king. And maybe God did send this message in the form of a flood, but its truth was mythologized and buried, and the lie propagated in spite of it. Resting water does not curve and convex. The natural laws of a resting body of water insist that it takes the exact shape of the container it fills and always finds and maintains a flat level. Resting water always rests flat and watching the water when we sit at vantage points, when journeying above in planes and before we take a sip from our drink, we must remember to never forget this law. Most of us instinctively understand the laws of water, and yet many continue their day-to-day -day willfully participating in the nonsensical heliocentric hoax. But for us that know that our Earth is not a spinning planet, in an infinite vacuum of space. The ones that have studied the sun diligently and realize that it is the sun that is moving and not the earth. The ones that have plotted the illogical routes of flight paths on a globe model 
and concluded that the model is incorrect. The ones that know that the laws of density govern the rise and fall of objects and have studied vanishing points. The ones that have forsaken conventional telescopic lenses, pondered rainbows, sun dogs, and the stars above us know that we reside within a dome firmament and there exists water above us. And the ones that understand that our entire enclosed earth system is governed by electromagnetism, frequency and vibration that emanates from a central magnetic north pole. We are the ones that scratch our heads and wonder how on earth we got in this heliocentric mess in the first place. And if meditating on the stars in the water beyond our firmament long enough, and on the electromagnetism, frequencies and vibrations that make them twinkle through so many shades of vibrant colours and geometric patterns, one might perhaps, just perhaps, ask, is there something more to electromagnetism? Something that has been missed or overlooked? Something untold or hidden? Electromagnetism is a fundamental force of Earth. The electromagnetic field takes the form of a torus in which all electromagnetism, frequency and vibration flows. A toroid is a revolving surface that takes the shape of a donut. Toroidal inductors and transformers are central to generating electric energy. There are many ways in which electromagnetism can be produced. We've looked at some before. We know that a magnetic field can produce electricity and that electricity can produce a magnetic field. It works both ways. Magnetism and electricity are inextricable. It is a dance of polarity. Electric charges either repel or attract each other. Magnetic poles attract or repel one another. For every North Pole, there is a corresponding South Pole. An electric current passing inside a wire creates a corresponding magnetic field outside of the wire. And an electric current is created in a loop of wire when it is moved toward or away from a magnetic field. Horseshoe magnets are powerful permanent magnets. Due to their shape, in which both magnetic poles are close together, a powerful, strong magnetic field is produced. The horseshoe magnet can also function as an electromagnet. The first ever electromagnet was invented in 1824, we are told, and was in the form of a horseshoe magnet. Its power was evident from the beginning. It weighed only 200 grams, but could lift 4 kilograms of iron. The key to the horseshoe magnet's power is the placement of its poles. You can see the magnetic field here, represented by the vector lines. If you look closely, you can see the concentration of the magnetic field is greater near the poles of the magnet. Since as far back as we can remember, we have been presented with and entertained ideas of the future. Not necessarily our future as individuals, but the future of humanity, technology and society at large. Whether it is in the form of Hollywood movies, you know the ones the action films, the science fiction sagas, and the animated kind. Or literature, music, 
and our exhibitions. In these we see our technology taken to its limits. Crafts fly. Computers live. Robots help out. Holographic screens decorate every room. Cities continue to grow upward into dominating skylines. Some can teleport and space travel is now possible and the accepted norm. Outside of fiction, we also have sobering documentaries telling us where we are heading, usually featuring narration by an old man, lamenting the unstoppable path we are on. It's all very serious. We are destroying our planet, the only one we have. And we have political parties, non-governmental organizations, and the trusted voices and scientific award-winning geniuses sharing similar messages. And really, when you look closer at both the fiction and the alleged facts, they all share the same underlying premise and principles. We are becoming so technologically advanced that the planet we reside on is no longer enough or can no longer sustain our activity. The advanced artificial intelligence systems, the flying crafts, the breakthroughs in cloning and medical beds mean that the natural world has suffered as a consequence. And depending on the type of genre you are entertaining, the solution is either 1. For humanity to perish as a result, perhaps destroyed by the very artificial intelligence systems it created in the first place, or perhaps by a natural, lung-choking virus that has mutated and is sweeping the earth to restore natural balance. Or two, for humans to say goodbye to their lonely little blue ball and head off into space in search of a new home. But you see, there is no globular planet and there is no space. And therefore all visions of the future are purely fictional and not particularly innocent. What we don't see emphasized in these visions of the future, however, is the potential of electromagnetism to transform all human life, technology and society. Which is strange when you consider that all life and the Earth itself is impossible without electromagnetism. Why wouldn't visionaries want to explore this in more detail? Could it be that they are not allowed to? Could it be that they are afraid of something? Afraid of us connecting one too many dots perhaps? And again, horseshoe magnets can act as powerful electromagnets. If a civilization was to advance technologically through the use of electromagnetism, then the horseshoe magnet would certainly have a tremendous role to play in that development. Yes, it certainly would. And it certainly did. The horseshoe magnet. The Arc de Triomphe. Yes, one of the most powerful electromagnets ever constructed.
Welcome to the future. Except it's the past. The future came and went and we missed it. The magnificent architecture we see throughout our realm in which the official liars and controllers of our world have termed historicist, neoclassical, renaissance, gothic and so on all belong to one whole unified civilization. A civilization so developed they had harnessed the power of electromagnetism to such a high degree that they not only built these huge structures but also crafted them with utter finesse and beauty. A celebration of their own technological advancement. The structures were designed with the sole intention of harvesting and generating electromagnetic energy and distributing it across the world. Their cities, towns an entire way of life ran and depended on the use of free, clean and powerful electromagnetic energy. The energy was harnessed and collected from the ionosphere above our heads through the use of antennas, spires, domes and towers. All the impossible structures we see today have been repurposed and rebranded by our controllers and the citizens of the 19th century. This is not a church. This is not a mosque. This is not a castle. And this is not a government building. These are generators, powerful and gargantuous. They would collect and generate the electromagnetic energy, which was then stored in huge power stations and distributed and redirected by sophisticated, advanced structures, one of which is the huge electromagnet, or what we've come to know as triumphal arches. The energy was stored in batteries and capacitors such as towers and obelisks. All cities were constructed across our realm in the form of one big interconnected power grid, much like a huge computer motherboard. I already know what you're thinking. What? He's finally lost it. He had us with Flat Earth, but this is just too much. I know, I know, I know. The backup programming is kicking in. But before you turn away to leave and cast aside your muddy boots, let me show you how it worked. As you know, we live on a flat stationary plane. At the center is a source of magnetism at the North Pole. And directly above this is Polaris, fixed at the central and highest point of a wondrous crystalline dome firmament. Beneath the firmament, different layers of atmosphere exist at different heights. The ionosphere starts at about 30 miles above Earth. It includes a thermosphere and the mesosphere. The ionosphere is an electrical atmosphere that is ionized by the sun's electromagnetism. It also forms the inner edge of the magnetosphere. I know, a lot of big words and abstract concepts. But you are familiar with this process and have been witness to it every day for the entirety of your lives. As you can see, 
The vials here contain molecular gases that are present in the atmosphere above us. When an electromagnetic source, such as a Tesla coil, is applied within close proximity of these gases, the coil's magnetic field ionizes or charges these gases and the result is phosphorescent plasma. The gases become colorized. This is why our sky is primarily blue. Because the sun's electromagnetic presence ionizes the atmosphere and the result is colored plasma. When the sun is entering or exiting our region, or what the liars of the world call sunrise and sunset, we see a variety of color gradients due to its distance from the ionosphere above us. When the sun is no longer journeying above our region, the sky loses its color and we can see the stars in the firmament beyond. Although the official scientists designate the ionosphere as an atmospheric layer, it is actually an ethereal layer. Ether is the fabric or element that carries electromagnetism. It connects everything in our realm. It is the fabric that makes us sun and moon and their concentric journey above our disk possible in the first place. Ether is the mysterious fifth element. It connects everything electromagnetically through vibrational energy. It is the glue, the web, the driving force behind absolutely everything. The four other elements, air, fire, water and earth, only exist because of the ether. They are expressions of ether's vibrations. Cymatics is a good example of ether's presence. The frequencies fed through the Cladney plate make the sand or salt form precise and complex geometric shapes. The higher the frequency, the more complex the geometric pattern. But what is the conduit? that takes the frequency's vibrations and allows the sand to take such shape. That is the ether at work. That's why we see fruits and vegetables that closely resemble cymatic patterns. It is the ether at work. All matter is ethereal and the shape and form of that matter are different expressions of the ether determined by frequency and vibration. Ether is the bridge between electromagnetic frequency and vibrational energy and the form of matter itself. You could call it the Holy Spirit of God. The historical and scientific discourse of ether is a deliberately manipulated one. The enemy introduced the truth only to discredit and subsequently bury it. Some of the alleged figures of the past have written on ether. The so-called Aristotle called it the fifth element. James Clerk Maxwell, the so-called father of electromagnetism, spoke of the ether, stating, In several parts of this treatise, an attempt has been made to explain electromagnetic phenomena by means of mechanical action transmitted from one body to another by means of a medium occupying the space between them. The undulatory theory of light also assumes the existence of a medium. We have now to show that the properties of the electromagnetic medium are identical with those of the luminiferous medium. The medium he refers to here is the ether. Albert Einstein 
and others successfully solidified the heliocentric model through fraudulent schools of scientific thought. But even Einstein could not deny the presence of ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. For in such space there would not only be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for the standards of space and time, measuring rods and clocks, nor therefore any space-time intervals in the physical sense. Even contemporary scientists, under the spell of heliocentrism, admit it is nonsensical to deny ether's existence. Today, the vacuum is recognized as a rich physical medium. A general theory of the vacuum is thus a theory of everything, a universal theory. It would be appropriate to call the vacuum ether once again. Returning to the ethereal ionosphere. As I said, this layer of ether above our heads is a constant sea of electromagnetism and is responsible for the color plasma above that we call the sky. The source of its electromagnetism is the sun. It is because of this ionized layer that we get ionospheric lightning in the form of sprites which in turn influence the thunderstorms below. An ion is a particle, atom or molecule with a net electrical charge. Electricity is a continuous flow of ions. The electrolytes in our body are ionized. Everything is connected by electromagnetism and the ether. Our highly developed and sophisticated historical ancestors not only understood the workings of the ionosphere and the ether, but they had developed methods to masterfully harvest it as a fuel to power the entire earth. And while the exact process by which they were able to extract the ether is deliberately hidden from us and remains unknown. The structural remains that humanity has since repurposed and reused as architecture offer us many clues as to how it all worked. The evidence is everywhere for those with eyes to see. And once you see it, it becomes so glaringly obvious that you'll kick yourself for never noticing in the first place. The matter is very complex and it will take time to really flesh out. So for now, let's have a closer look at some of these structures and I will introduce some basic concepts. As we continue our journey, we will explore everything in more detail. We see them everywhere. On top of all these magnificent structures, Towers, spires and pinnacles that rise into piercing antennas. It was through these complex antennas that the ether was harvested. You see, after the great reset of the 1800s, the enemy fractured the old world's unified understanding of God and created multiple religions to try and hide God and justify the existence of such grand and beautiful technological structures. And I know this may trigger some people, but stay with me, I will not let you down. But for now, it is critical to understand that a lot of the religious icons that adorn and make up these antennas were never indicators of different religions in the old world nor were they intended to be. They signaled something else entirely. They are usually made from copper and gold, both 
are excellent conductors of electricity. In many of the structures we call cathedrals, the symmetrical spikes on the pinnacles worked in a similar fashion, extracting ether from the ionosphere. Once harvested, the energy would inevitably have been drawn down into the top larger portion of these domed structures. When examining many of the interiors of these domes, we come to realize that they rely heavily on symmetrical ornamentation. This is achieved by indentation or cavities in the masonry. In the world of electromagnetism, a cavity resonator works through symmetry to produce oscillation or vibration of energetic particles. Symmetrical shapes force energetic particles or ions to vibrate in a constant manner. Is this why we see perfect symmetrical ornamentation within the ceiling of many domed structures? It no doubt sounds absurd, but the majority of these structures also feature a smaller type of cavity resonator, or what is more appropriately termed cavity magnetrons, that offer some clarity as to the real function of these structures. A cavity magnetron is a high-powered vacuum tube that generates microwaves using the interaction of a stream of ions with a magnetic field while in the cavity resonator. A magnetron operates through a hollowed, symmetrical vacuum. It emits powerful microwaves that can act as a source of free energy. If you break the symmetry or close the vacuum, it no longer functions. But can you see the resemblance? These structures were never intended to hold glass within them. The controllers added the stained glass to the rose windows to shut off the magnetron's function. They closed out instruments of free energy. And they are everywhere in these structures. Interestingly, if you look at the geometry of entire sections of the structures themselves, then it becomes very evident that they functioned in their entirety like a cavity magnetron to generate energy. All cavity magnetrons consist of a central heated circular metal chamber in which the current leaves and it's called a cathode. Look at that word. Cathode. Does it remind you of another word? Cathedral. Cathode. Like with everything else, they corrupt the truth and hide things in plain sight. The controllers removed most of the cathodes integral to these cavity magnetrons. But there are some structures today in which you can see traces of the old cathodes still present. The heavy reliance on symmetry and cavities within these structures is not coincidental. The symmetrical ornamentation would have worked in a similar manner, causing the energetic particles to vibrate in a constant manner. The flowers within the squares can be understood as similar to acoustic resonators, working to vibrate the ions. It is here that the energy would have been continually manipulated into vibrational and electromagnetic energy 
of specific frequencies. Really look at these magnificent acoustic resonators. Could you craft one of these by hand today and at such height? Why would an underdeveloped people spend so much of their time crafting such perfect symmetrical ornamentation? Especially if it had no function and was purely aesthetic. They wouldn't. The cavity resonators and magnetrons would have had to have worked in partnership with a central engine or reactor contained within all these structures. Both resonator and reactor are interesting words. Just like the words conductor, generator, creator and the name Mercator, they all contain the word Tor within their linguistic structure. They hold a linguistic memory and pay homage to the torus or toroidal field. The torus is the flow of electromagnetism. Without this flow of energy, there would be no life on Earth. No one can really know for sure, but some have suggested that the engine was probably similar to a fusion reactor. The traces of these engines can be found within all of the larger generators. The empty shell of where the engine used to reside is usually, but not always, octagonal. It's been right in front of our faces the whole time. The controllers remove the engines, sometimes repurposing the space as baptistries and bandstands, sometimes just leaving the base either barren or attempting to cover them up. We see these octagonal structures in cathedrals, government buildings, mosques, and detached bandstands. And unless they have been repurposed, these structures seem to hold no overall function. They do not contribute to the overall structure. They appear superfluous and unnecessary. Theories have surfaced that the engines or central technological mechanism was similar to a tokamak. And while I do not subscribe to this idea, which will become evident as to why later in our journey, for now we will use it for illustrative purposes. A tokamak is a powerful device that uses a magnetic field to produce plasma in the form of a torus. The contemporary tokamaks we see are used in thermonuclear fusion power. The tokamak's toroidal field, in conjunction with the vibrating ions from the ether, would have produced a highly conductive electromagnetic field of gases, called plasma, just like our sun and ionosphere. If those of the old world used anything closely resembling a tokamak's capability, then the result would have been an abundance of free, powerful, clean electromagnetic energy that could fuel entire cities and the entire Earth. These were never churches, cathedrals, castles and parliament buildings. They were all huge engine generators. The controllers invented labels and terms such as Renaissance, Greco-Roman and so on to describe the style of these structures. But as you can see, all these magnificent, impossible structures all share the same fundamental structural principles and design, despite location, time period and cultures. And this is because they were created 
with the sole purpose of generating energy. And just because these structures were never used for prayer and worship does not mean they were not holy sites. The civilizations of the past had a relationship with the Source and the Holy Spirit or the ether like no other. And they paid homage, reverence and thanks to it by constructing their generators with such splendor and beauty. And not only that, but they constructed the entirety of their structures, statues and ornamentation in reverence of this gift, in reverence of the energy production that made their way of life possible in the first place. The Laurel Reef, which the satanic controllers have corrupted in their appropriation of the symbol and redesignation of it to represent Apollo and Lucifer is, in fact, a toroidal coil. And we see the toroidal coil throughout the old world's infrastructure, a simultaneously having both a function and a celebration of this function. Electromagnetic coils are electrical conductors. They are used in applications where electric current interacts with a magnetic field. In devices such as generators, motors, inductors and transformers. Most coils take the form of a toroidal coil or spiral. Wire coils are used in conjunction with a magnet to produce powerful electromagnetism. The more turns of the wire, the stronger the magnetic field. Coils generate vortexes, which in turn create an electromagnetic field. It's all one interconnected system. And we see it everywhere. This is what columns and rotundas were used for. Powerful coils to generate electromagnetism and carry the current in loops. The torus is found at the base of pretty much every column found throughout our realm. It is everywhere. Look at the movement of electricity through a wire and the simultaneous magnetic field it produces. This is exactly the shape of a column. And we see this present in all of these gigantic and meticulously crafted columns. This is why we see the magnetic field represented at the top of a lot of columns. It's the movement of the ions in the magnetic field. It's the movement of the toroid and the toroidal vortex. As you saw, coils of copper wire are essential in electrifying the magnet. And I know what you want to say. That's great, but the columns and other structures you are referring to are made of stone. But you see, all of these impossible structures are made from a mixture of stone and metal. They used iron bars in their construction. Iron is magnetic.
These iron rods run throughout the stone infrastructure and are complemented with copper and gold roofing. Copper and gold are strong conductors of electricity. Often we find entire statues, arches, domes and roofing made from a distinctive blue copper. Furthermore, the limestone, granite and dolomite stone is mixed with crystal silicon or quartz. Quartz has strong electric potential. The colonnades and arches we see everywhere were at once integral components to the overall electromagnetic infrastructure. While also constructed in geometric forms that mirror the flow of electromagnetic energy such as coil loops, horseshoe magnetic fields and toroidal vortexes. As with everything else constructed in the old world, they were both functional and crafted as a homage to that function. A lot of ethereal energy was stored in structures constructed from red bricks and concrete. Red bricks and concrete are excellent conductors of electricity. They operated as huge capacitors or batteries. According to new research, red bricks can be converted into energy storage units that can be charged to hold electricity, like a battery, and can store energy until required for powering devices. The key to this battery-like function inherent within red brick is the iron oxide. The development and use of red brick is so important and we will be returning to this subject much later in our journey. The really big red brick power stations and batteries were designated and recognisable by their white stripes such as St Pancras Railway Station in London and many other satanic deceptions and abuses as we are. They were not raised believing they existed on a lonely globular rock spinning in the vacuum of space. The true, ethereal, electromagnetic properties of the Earth were not hidden from them. They knew there was a domed firmament above their heads. They studied it, they imitated its properties and understood its central relationship with the entire ethereal existence of electromagnetism. They revered the magnificence of its craft and showed utmost gratitude to the source. Look. Domes. <laughs>